Okay, today we're going to uh, do several things. We're going to finish up with our discussion of some of the persuasion theories that we didn't have time for in previous tapes, namely Al Monroe's taxonomy of the motivated sequence. And then we're going to look at elaboration likelihood uh, theory, cognitive involvement theory, the elaboration likelihood model that goes with that central and peripheral processing. Then we'll go back and we'll review for that wonderful exam one that's coming up. Uh, we'll do that in a couple of ways. The first thing I'll want to do is go back and review some key theories with you. Systems theory, uh, go back over nonverbal concepts, uh, look at some of the persuasion material and overview. And then finally, we'll go back to your syllabus outline. We'll just look at those topics that we've covered since day one. And at that point, if there are questions uh, that uh, class members have that you want to raise. If I haven't clarified things already, it's at that point then that we'll start taking interaction rather than shotgunning at this point over every topic that's been covered uh, in the tape so far. So the first thing we're going to do is take a brief look at motivated sequence. Uh, this is the little uh, taxonomy that Al Monroe provided. You should have that in your workbook. And there are five basic steps to this. Now, we call this a taxonomy because it's what? A list of related concepts. But it doesn't predict, it doesn't explain human behavior. So it doesn't have the status of a theory. And that's that important distinction that we make. But Monroe said if you're making a persuasive presentation, whether it's a big public speech or uh, just interpersonally, you're trying to convince a friend of something. The first thing you have to do is get their attention. Okay, what kinds of things do we pay attention to? Well, color, movement, sound, uh, big rather than small, you know, we, um, loud rather than soft, bright rather than dull. All of those kinds of things capture your attention. And um, so that's the first step. Then you need to show the audience what they need. You know, is there a problem? Do they need your product? Do they need a vacation? Uh, what is it you're about that establishes either a problem area or a need in the mind of the audience? Okay, the third area is satisfaction, uh, or and in some textbooks, they'll call that the solution phase. But how are you going to satisfy the need? How are you going to solve the problem? If transportation is a problem, uh, how, what, what is it that you're recommending to satisfy that? More freeways, light rail, uh, some sort of proposal on your part. Street flooding, what's the solution? Okay, we're missing some people today due to a tropical depression. And uh, that's a problem. But the, the speaker would need to satisfy that need, advocate something that would solve that problem. Then an important step is visualization. The idea of, of helping the audience see things in a different way. Uh, before Enron Field was built, uh, before the, you know, the, we've got a stadium going up, now, before the Astrodome was built, somebody had to dream that dream and visualize that and with the help of some engineers and architects, get some models and plans made so that they could take those proposals and tell people, you know, we need that. Once upon a time, San Francisco had no Golden Gate Bridge. You know, but somebody had to recognize the problem, or at least comparative advantagely, uh, how much better it would be if you could connect those two points and convince people that this was viable, help them visualize it, and see that it really was something that could be accomplished. The fifth step is action, and that's simply the phase. What do you want the audience to do? You want them to roll up their sleeves and donate blood? Do you want them to give money for your cause? Do you want them to take flyers? and pass them out to classmates? Do you want them to write letters to their congressman? Uh, what is the action that you want on the part of the audience? 
often it's a behavioral action, but sometimes it's a cognitive action. You know, I'm not asking you to do anything today. I know you don't have the money, perhaps, given who the audience is. You know, you don't have the money to do this yet, but I assume that one of these years you're all going to be affluent graduates of U of H. And when you're that rich alum, then I want you to come back and donate to this, participate in the Alumni Association, give us lots of money to endow chairs, you know, whatever it might be. So sometimes it's a cognitive change that you're asking for. Sometimes it's an emotional change. Uh, and sometimes it's a behavioral change. And we'll see those more. Actually, when we get all the way on to the last unit in the mass media theory, and we look at kinds of changes that the media produces. But we're jumping ahead a little bit, so we don't want to go there today. OK, the other theory that we didn't have time for the other day that's an important one is cognitive involvement uh, theory. This is the petty, and I guess he pronounces his name Cachapo. I've never uh, actually heard it pronounced. I've just seen it in plenty of literature. But this is called the cognitive involvement theory. And he has what's called the ELM model that we won't go into in detail here. It's the elaboration likelihood model. But what he's looking at is how likely and, and the extent to which the perceivers elaborate and focus on and centrally route information coming into their brains. Okay? Uh, there was one day in here that I made, I've forgotten now what the announcement was, but I'm sure I said it at least five times because I was starting, this is after class, but I was starting to get annoyed because somebody came up and asked me something. I said, okay, this is the fifth time I'm going to answer this question. And the answer is, and, and the student said, well, you know, I was, I was busy taking notes. I was watching the PowerPoint. I didn't hear what you said. I knew you said something, but I couldn't remember. Yeah, well, I couldn't, it wasn't couldn't remember. Never got it in the first place. Okay, what was happening is that that message was coming in on what's called peripheral routing. It's there, it's, it's kind of getting into your brain, but it's not in central focus. Now sometimes when that happens, we can go back and say, did you see that billboard on 610, loop 610, about such and such? Or did you notice the, the headline on the Houston Chronicle the other day that said thus and so? And if you stop and think about it, then you might be able to pull that out of your memory bank and say, you know, I did see that, but, but maybe you just saw it in, in uh, one of those you know, put your money in the machine, buy the newspaper thing, and so you, you just looked at the headline as you went by. Or maybe the newspaper was on a table and it belonged to someone else, and so you didn't actually read it. You just kind of saw it. You like saw it. <laughs> okay. I'm not real fond of that word, but sometimes it fits. Uh, on the other hand, there are things that are centrally processed. How many of you got up this morning and watched a weather report before you got in your car? Okay, most of the class, okay, because we have lots of street flooding as I speak to you. Okay, and, and I even watched the report, even though I live close to campus and knew that I could wade in if I needed to. Uh, I needed to anticipate how many students would be here today and uh, whether or not the students in my 10 o'clock class would, in fact, be there for the exam that's scheduled. So that was important information, and it was centrally processed. And just as seriously as many of you were watching that weather report, so was I, tracking the storms along 59, noting that Sugar Land was in deep water. Uh, because it wasn't raining that much over here. It was raining enough to make it a bad hair day uh, for most people, if you have hair. You know. But uh, anyway, I was centrally processing. I'm not picking on anybody. Okay, the shoe fits, wear it. Okay, uh, but I was centrally processing that information. And you do that when you listen to lectures. Sometimes you listen to a lecture and you're just going, mm-hmm, yeah, right. And you're tuned right in on that. Uh, but I've been an undergraduate, and I know, you know, that, that there are days you sit there and you may look attentive. Sometimes you don't even look attentive. You just go on to sleep and that's it. Uh, but... Uh, 
you know, you look attentive, but that information's really not going into the center of your brain. So obviously, which one's going to produce a better and more significant attitude change? Central, sure. Those messages that are centrally processed are the ones that are likely to be remembered, that are likely to have a significant impact on your semantic space, on your cognitive processes, uh, that are likely to produce some real kind of change. And those things that you only get peripherally uh, will be superficial in nature. Now this is all tied into a lot of, of what I've said before, what Dr. Williamson has been saying about our needs, about our motivation levels. The weather report was important. You were motivated to watch that because that was directly relevant to you. Okay, other times you're going, what do I need this information for? You know, why do I need to study microorganisms or uh, constellations that are millions of miles away or whatever. Other, but some people know those things and, you know, have very good reason and, and good relationship and relevance to that. So uh, often there's a combination of the two things that are occurring. You know, you, you may get uh, some messages processed through a combination of the two routes. You catch part of it on the news coming in and then somebody will uh, relay a message to you or you may uh, encounter someone who has additional information. So it isn't always an either or kind of thing. It may be one and then be, I mean it could be one or the other, but it may very well be a combination of the two. Uh, that you, you pick up messages off the TV, you read the article, you know, peripheral off of the TV set, but then it's a central routing that occurs when you read an article in a magazine or in the newspaper, centrally routed when someone talks to you, peripherally routed if you're standing in a quick food line and you hear people chatting. So you can get combinations of those things. Okay, any question about uh, ELM? model cognitive involvement theory. Okay, well let's turn then back to uh, systems theory uh, in part because it's, it's really important. It's the broadest theory that we have. Uh, we started that with that one as an example of a general theory. And this is, uh, this will also give you an idea how if, if you did it in written form how you might incorporate some of these concepts into uh, the paper that you'll be writing this semester. Okay, uh, this student created a Mr. Wink who is going to take you through uh, the journey of systems theory and you know if you haven't got it yet well for sure you should by the time we get through with this little visual presentation. Okay, a reminder that a system is a set of parts or interrelated parts that form a unique whole in an environment they're set apart by a boundary. They're usually open rather than closed. And you can see a number of key terms right there that one could ask you about on an exam. Terms you might want to use in a paper. Uh, system, objects, interrelated, structured, wholeness, the unique whole, environment, boundary, open versus closed. Okay, we said that the open system is the one that has exchange with its environment. Okay, and that's virtually everything that we need to concern ourselves about. There are closed systems that have no exchange with the environment. Uh, your battery operated watch, a security system, computerized security systems, and things like that. But even those have, have just a hint of openness to them. The security system needs electricity. The thermostat and the room monitoring air control uh, needs the air and so forth. So the only totally closed systems are like the watch when once the battery's been changed at least it's it's closed for a long time. The universe theoretically would be a closed system. Why? Because there's nothing beyond itself. There's nothing for it to exchange. Even though it's really really big uh, there's nothing outside the universe. Well, this one gets a little philosophical. So, but anyway, the main thing is that 
that uh, you want to concern yourselves with open systems because whether it's cells in your body getting oxygen or plants needing water and sunshine or what you know all the way up through the the simple to the complex okay uh, mr wink is now introducing you to a family that we're going to apply have a, some of these concepts applied to uh, the johnsons okay there's stephen johnson he's 46 an engineer the father of two uh, Nicole, 43, the businesswoman, mother of two. Susie, 18, going off to college. Uh, Nat, 15, who is a rebel. And Sniffles, the family dog, who says woof woof from time to time. Okay, uh, noting most importantly to all of this that the family is an open system. And so whether it's your work environment, uh, the University of Houston, a family, you know, lots of things are open systems. Okay, the seven characteristics of a system, and I won't go back through all of those today unless somebody's hung up on one, but we talked about wholeness, equilibrium, hierarchy, interdependence, equifinality, change and adaptability, and exchange with the environment. Is there anything that you'd like for us to go back and recap on there? Okay, remember equifinality, equifinality is the goal-seeking behavior. That's usually the hardest word there. Okay, here's an application of that. When having a family meeting, you know, the notion of that wholeness is greater than some of the parts, it's more valuable for the entire family to come in and take part in the meeting than it would be for just the dog and the father to be there. They'd be pretty useless. So you want everybody there. Okay, Dad's saying, where is everyone? It's family discussion night and no one is here. We all need to be here if we're going to talk about where we want to go for a vacation. And so there's a problem because the system is not whole. And Sniffles, in his usual articulate manner, says, rough. Okay, second characteristic was interdependence and how those parts affect each other. Uh, here's an example. If the dog decides to hide uh, the car keys, then you have problems. No car keys, Stephen can't go to work, Nicole can't drop the kids off at school. If Susie misses school, then she'll miss basketball practice and now will be late for a test. If Stephen goes no, doesn't go to work, he may lose his job. Nicole may not be able to get to her business. If the parents lose their jobs, there will be no money and no food for the dog. Poor Sniffles. Okay, so there you go. The dog's hidden the keys. Stephen can't go to work. Nicole can't do her thing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Interdependence. Okay, equilibrium. Again, how we maintain, how the system maintains balance. If the family has saved money for their vacation to go to Disneyland, uh, but had to use it or they use that money on their vacation to Disneyland, then they have to try to earn that money back, uh, get caught up on those expenses. Okay, goal-seeking behavior. Stephen, Nicole, and Susie may all try to get Nat to study harder at school, uh, so he'll do better. And the family will do anything to get Nat to study, including bribing, pleading, begging, uh, until the goal has not, I think we've got an extra word there. Anyway, they'll work on that goal and do anything that they can to accomplish that goal. So here they go, well, I hate studying. Well, you know, I'll pay you $20. I beg you, son, study. Please study, son. And Stiffle says, I'll be an angel if you'll study. Okay. Uh, hierarchy, you can, uh, families differ sometimes, the mother's the head, sometimes the dad's the head, sometimes the kids are in charge, uh, but anyway, and this one, um, Kataki made mom king, so they're having this discussion of, you know, what they can and cannot have money for, and uh, poor Stuffles can't have any burgers, so he's frustrated too. Okay, change in adaptability in our example here shows Susie uh, going off to college and the adaptation that has to be made from that. Uh, sometimes if finances get tight 
and an uh, extra member of the family has to go to work, then there's an adaptation that has to be made. If one of the members of the family becomes hospitalized, um, you know, it may uh, cause, again, uh, disruptions. Okay, but here goes Susie off to college, and she thinks it's time to party, and anyway, there they are uh, making the adjustment to uh, that departure. Sometimes empty nest is a wonderful thing. Sometimes it's a frustrating thing. And then exchange with the environment was the last thing that we talked about. And in this case, uh, the family has exchange with the environment, the school systems, trying to educate and uh, socialize their children and so forth. And even uh, sniffles or any other dog or cat that you might take home, you know, you start with that puppy or kitten and try to train them so that they are socialized into an appropriate pet. Okay, any question about systems theory while we get the next little presentation up here? That one pretty clear to everybody. Okay, let's go back then and uh, we'll take a, do a little review of some of our nonverbal concepts because we've got some uh, vocabulary and jargon there that's a little bit different. Okay, remember we talked about the word kinesics and this Whoops, got ahead there. Come on, PowerPoint, go back. Okay. Uh, kinesics, which was the study of body language, refers to facial expression, gestures, posture, not your voice. We'll come to paralanguage again in a minute. Uh, but the things that you do with your body that communicates. Okay, and that was kinesics, body language, posture, facial expression eye movement, gestures, and the impact that those areas have on communication. Okay, proxemics was the study of how space affects the communication process. And we identified four areas that are pertinent. These are the distances that are appropriate for American culture. Okay, they'll vary from, from culture to culture. But in the United States, intimate distance is 0 to 18 inches or roughly elbows length. Uh, you know, you have to be at ground zero to kiss and hug and do the fun stuff. Okay, personal distance, which was 18 inches to 3 and a half feet, uh, roughly arm's length, depending on how long your arm is. But the, it's in that range that you pat people on the shoulder, shake hands, do things that are personal, they may involve touching, but are not as personal as intimate. Social distance, 4 to 12 feet. Any problem with that? Okay, and public distance beyond 12 feet. You, you usually are that far away if you're, quote, making a speech of some sort. But you don't stand beyond 12 feet uh, trying to be friendly and sociable and discuss your vacation plans or whatever. Okay, and there's some examples of personal and public and social. Okay, paralanguage is the use of the voice. It's also sometimes called vocalics, but how we use the voice, particularly with pitch, rate, volume, and tone, uh, to send messages, uh, sarcasm, interest, enthusiasm, those kinds of things. And we did some content-free speech discussion. Artifacts, artifacts are not the fossils that the archaeologists dig up, although you could kind of make a, a parallel metaphor to that. But the artifacts are any objects that communicate. Uh, an open umbrella, you know, you look out your window and it looks pretty sunny outside, but, you've, but you see people with open umbrellas, then uh, you may wonder if it's one of those days when it's raining when the sun is shining. And uh, that takes you to cognitive dissonance, too, because you'd need to figure that out. But anyway, objects that communicate, whether it's uh, logos, brand name labels, the kinds of cars people drive, the type of furniture that they have in their office, uh, art objects that are on the walls, those kinds of items. Okay, and we talked about touch, which is also called haptics. 
uh, the importance of that and uh, how it's an important element in human communication that people need touch and we'll come back to that theme more as we develop the interpersonal communication material. Chronemics was the study of time, how time influences communication. You know, there's some things you don't get there on time, you just miss them, uh, like your class, okay, or an appointment that you have, or a job interview, or a, your favorite TV show, you know, that you can't call the network and say, oh, well, you know, it just wasn't convenient for me to uh, watch my show at 7 p.m. Would you run it again for me at 10 p.m.? No. <laughs> you know. Now, there have been some instances, I'm told, where, where the programming has preempted the soap operas, and that freaks out so many people that they actually run them again at 1 a.m. or something, so people can stay up and stay, stay up and watch those. Sometimes, of course, the programming is just delayed by half an hour or so, and that's a different matter. But chronemics are, are we, of course, as Americans, are a very time-conscious, timeline-oriented uh, culture. But in other places, it's much more flexible. And we talked about uh, the notion of owls and larks, that there are those people who stay up late and can't get up in the morning, and then there are those people who fall asleep by 9.30 or 10, and they're up bright and early and... I'm one of those larks. I was on campus by 6 a.m. today, you know, to make sure I had it all together. Yeah, a couple of you look surprised. Some of you are here but not awake yet, uh, that sort of thing. Well, you're owls, and that's okay. You know, it takes all kinds of folks to make the world work together. We just need to be careful. We don't, you know, owls and larks shouldn't be rooming together unless they're really kind and considerate and so forth. Okay, we talked about other environmental factors, too, that uh, influence nonverbal communication. The color, the comfort, the temperature in the room, uh, how comfy the chairs are or are not. Uh, restaurants are a good example of the environmental factors. If you think about the difference between fast food restaurants, mid, middle of the road, price, comfort, restaurants, and then those places where you go and blow $100 a person in an evening and have lots of ambiance and stay for hours and so forth. Uh, well, often, what, now you're, you're paying for better food, too, but you know, you're also paying for the ambiance so maybe the view from the top of the hotel looking at the uh, Golden Gate Bridge or you're on top of the RCA building, I think it is, in, New York that has the rainbow room and you know just right out the window there's the top of the Empire State Building. You have to pay for that, you know. But it's, for most people it's worth it, you know. It's it's a very different thing to sit 35 or 60 stories up or whatever you are in some major city and to have dinner while you see the city versus uh popping through your favorite fast food spot and eating your hamburger or whatever it is, your chicken strips, in the car, <laughs> looking at the freeway or whatever, even going inside. So anyway, color and atmosphere are very interesting. We spend lots of, uh, to the extent that money lets us, we spend a lot of our money trying to create the right ambiance in our apartment or in our home or in our office. because the, and, then it, and it ties back into artifacts because we choose those objects that we believe will communicate to the people around us. Okay, that finishes that review. Uh, let's go now to persuasion. Kind of recap some of this. And then we'll be throwing it open. Uh, for most anything. Okay, we didn't really get into the ethics of persuasion, but I and I would just kind of and I'm not going to test any of you over that, but I just want you to be aware that this is an area that there is an ethical responsibility. And you'll learn a lot in this class about how to manipulate people, particularly when we get to the interpersonal unit. We'll talk about everything from uh promises and bribes to lies and so forth. Uh 
but it's important to me and I hope it'll be important to you that there's a strong ethical consideration uh, to all of this. Okay. Uh, one good way to figure out whether this is a, is a persuasive message or a brainwashing is to ask yourself, uh, or coercion, you know, I think we said uh, in one of the earlier lectures that you can kind of view this persuasion process as being a midway point between suggestion and coercion. Well, one of the ways you know you're in the persuasive domain is if you actually have a choice. Okay, if somebody's holding a gun to your head, you know, how much choice do you have? Okay, oh. would you feel comfortable if you were the recipient of the message instead of the sender? If somebody were doing this to you, would you be comfortable with that? Okay, types of persuasive context or situations, presentations. We hear sales presentations, we get phone solicitations regularly, uh, but people make proposals in the work environment. Uh, there are motivational speeches, there are goodwill speeches. All of those, let me put those back up a second, all of those are kinds of uh, situations that we find ourselves in where people may be delivering persuasive messages to us, trying to get us to do something to change our ideas, change our behavior. We talked about that. Okay, some of the specific strategies, and you'll see some overlap between this unit and the interpersonal unit, but appeal to the needs of your audience, and that takes us back to Alan Monroe and the taxonomy that we were talking about earlier today. Have a realistic goal. Uh, I've had students in, in persuasion classes or public speaking classes making persuasive speeches be frustrated because they didn't accomplish the goal that they had for the audience. They wanted everybody in the class to sign an organ donor card on the spot. Well, if you haven't thought about that, and probably your generation has thought about it more than students 10 years ago or 20 years ago had. But if you've not thought about that ever, the first time you cognitively process that information, you may have some reticence. You know, you just might not be sure that that's what you want to do. And so, if you're trying, or if your goal is to get everybody in this class to give you, to, to sign up at least and promise to give you $5,000 for cause X before they leave today. How likely is that to happen? Mm -mm. <laughs> it's just not happening, you know. And, and even those few in here who might be able to afford it probably want to think through it and want to check it out and, and so forth. So it's not a realistic goal. Now, to make you aware, to get you thinking, to say this is really what I want you to do, but I don't expect you to do it today, so just breathe, you know. But please, seriously, because that might be a viable approach to say that I want to increase the awareness of my audience about whatever it is in anticipation of planting that seed and um, accomplishing something long range. Uh, a good strategy focuses appeals on the critical audience segment. Uh, don't preach to the choir, is kind of what this is saying. You know, if you're making a persuasive presentation, then the focus needs to be on those people who have a very different viewpoint from your own. Not so different, remember what Dr. Williamson said last time, not so different that it's going to backfire on you. But those people who are over in that moderate range who uh, sort of agree with you and you want them to really agree, or those people who kind of disagree with you, but with some good reasoning and evidence could be persuaded to shift. And she talked with you a lot, remember, about how in any given audience like this one, there's a lot of latitude in the attitudes of the people in the room. Uh, sometimes there's also latitude in the individual attitude. That while basically you're for or against capital punishment, or one I like to use, uh, you're, most of you have an opinion you're either for 
are against uh, birth control and, and certain contraceptives. Okay, uh, and maybe take something like the morning after pill. Now, some of you would be totally opposed to that. Others would say, no, I'm in favor of that. But then I, I might say, well, are you so much in favor of it that you think a woman ought to just be able to, you know, pop them every day of the week or, you know, have a whole bottle full and just, you know, really have a active sex life and just take those pills as, of, as often as prescriptions allow. I don't even know how often you can take them without killing yourself. But, you know, uh, so, but, but the people who say, yes, you know, that's a good thing to take might say, well, no, now wait a minute. You know, there, there's a point where, no, you shouldn't be taking them three times a week. Or somebody who's in favor of abortion, and say, I will deal with this issue, she won't, oh, uh, might say, well, yes, I'm in favor of abortion, but, you know, I don't think you ought to be hopping down and getting one every month. I mean, let, let's get a better plan. I mean, who would want to, you know? But, but there should be a better plan here. So even though... My attitude is a particular thing. It, if I have to check a little box on a seven-point scale and say, today, this is where my attitude is, chances are, if you got to talking to me about that, you'd find out, well, it's essentially here, except, and we put some qualifiers on that uh, so that, oh, you know, under, it's kind of like, remember law's perspective, this is the law under conditions one, two, three, four. Well, this is my position, that doesn't make my position a law, but it's the same idea of putting conditions on a perspective or on a point of view. Okay, you sometimes defer the thesis with a hostile audience, that just means don't tell them at the beginning what you want. You know, all that garbage you get over the telephone with the solicitations, how you've won something or whatever, you know, they, they're they usually uh, deferring their thesis because what they want is for you to buy something. But they don't start out and say, I want you to spend $5,000 for siding on your house because I would say, no, thank you, and hang up. But you know how the spiel goes, we're, we're working in your neighborhood and we'd be happy to come by and give you a free estimate. There's no obligation. You know, there's always an obligation. But anyway, we'll, 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 I won't get on that soapbox. But sometimes you need to defer your thesis. Okay, you want to present ample evidence. Um, although interestingly enough, enough, evidence is not always statistics. You know, sometimes people think you're... You're only presenting evidence if, if we've got the hard, cold facts, if we've got the data to back it up. And certainly that quantitative support is an important part of the message. Okay? But one of the things that, that we've learned through all this persuasion research, and uh, you know, there's lots of research going on as we speak, one of the things people like best is narrative. And remember the day we talked about a fantasy theme analysis, analysis and Fisher's narrative theory and so forth. People like to hear stories. Don't you like it better when I'm telling you a story, when I'm giving you an example? You almost feel like I'm not lecturing. Well, it's not true. You know, you probably enjoyed Dr. Williamson, but the part you enjoyed the most was the stories. Okay? People like stories. And if you think about how much of any given day of your day that you either spend telling a story or listening to a story. And we like for people to tell stories well, too. We don't want that, but storytelling is another whole course you can take. Okay. Uh, but we, you, know, you can't drag the story out too much. You can't ruin the punchline. You shouldn't provide too many details. You shouldn't upstage the other person from telling their story. And, you know, there, are, there are lots more rules than that, but that's just a little sampler. Uh, but, we, but we learn and we're persuaded by the narratives that we hear. You know, uh, there was some poor lady on the news, I guess, the night before last maybe, anyway, who'd driven, she was not from the Houston area, she'd driven her car into deep water. Uh, she, or she, she went to the, 
the uh, grocery store and the water rose so fast and she hadn't, that's what it was, she didn't drive into it. But she came out of the store and her car was under, well, not totally, but you know, too much to drive. And she had no idea that that sort of thing could happen. Well, if you've lived around here, you know that kind of thing can happen. And you know which intersections tend to flood and you know which ones to avoid. But a lot of that you didn't learn directly. Remember when we talked about semantic space and Osgood, the cobras and the snakes and death and those things? Uh, a sign. See how these theories come together and help each other? I'm really not off on tangents. Uh, this is an integrated application of what we're talking about. Because we learn these things indirectly. And those things we learn indirectly we call assigns. Okay? But we learn them indirectly often because of the stories or the narratives that people tell. And so often, we're, part of our evidence is that we're persuaded by uh, the story that's told. And if there's a good, you know, in Aristotle, we just had Aristotle, pathos, ethos, logos, okay? Uh, but one of the things he said you can do, too, is give examples or tell stories. And when you get a really good narrative of a harrowing traffic ex accident, uh, a dramatic flood story, uh, a bizarre case in the registration process around here, uh, a story of a fantastic sale that's on at the mall. Uh, any of those kinds of things may lend themselves either directly or indirectly, depending on whether it's peripherally or centrally routed into your brain, to as a persuasive message that results in change. Okay, do you consider citing the opposing ideas? And there's all, there's all kinds of research that's been done on one-sided versus two-sided presentations. Uh, if your audience is going to act pretty quickly, like if you're going out to vote this afternoon, and I know that you support my candidate, then I should probably just give you a one-sided presentation. Remember, we're going out to support candidate a, because this is the person for the job, because, and be sure to remind anybody you see to vote for this person. If you know, though, that the audience has already been exposed <clears throat> to both sides, and that takes you back into inoculation theory and the biological immunization stuff, you know, but if, if you know that the audience is aware of both sides of the issue, as you are with most social issues from abortion to assisted suicide, capital punishment, all those kinds of things, then a two-sided presentation is usually better because this lets the audience know that you've looked at the other point of view and that you're not just being a narrow-minded, narrow-focused, pig-headed fanatic about your topic, but you really have examined all these issues from different perspectives and uh, and particularly if you can use a refutational style and say, I've looked at these three arguments and I know some of you support that point, you know, th these points of view are important to you, but number one, I don't go along with because, and number two, I can't support because, and number three, especially, there is evidence that's contrary to that and I want you to be aware of that. So, you know, let's look at these four reasons four reasons for doing whatever I'm advocating, and you go back and reinforce those. So citing that opposing viewpoint is often important. Uh, you adapt to the cultural style of your audience. Uh, is this a very formal occasion? Is this informal? Uh, you're just, if you take an actual performance class, then we'd spend more time uh, worrying about those things. But it's kind of the when in Rome uh, do as the Romans do. We've talked a little already about appealing to the needs of your audience. Uh, most of you are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of survival needs all the way up to self-actualization and you want to tap into as many of those as you particularly can. I was talking with you a while ago about satisfaction, how the satisfaction step solves the problem and uh, it's going. Okay, social judgment theory. Uh, I talked about, Dr. Williamson
talked about. So this is kind of a recap of what we've done already, and I won't go back uh, through it. Just recognize that there are latitudes of attitude of acceptance, rejection, non-commitment. The and this is all in your workbook too, so you shouldn't need to write it down again. Okay. Um, your ego involvement and and uh, uh, salience and intensity make a difference. Okay. Credibility we've talked about. You want to maximize your credibility by showing your competence, earning the trust of your audience, showing how similar you are to the audience. That will increase your appeal. Appearing, being sincere would be appropriate, not just appearing sincere, but demonstrate that you're sincere about this issue. Okay, um, let's move now to our general review and just see what you would like for us to recap on here. Okay, the first thing we talked about back tape one, lecture one, was the communication process. We talked about transactional, linear, interactive communication. Anything we need to go back and clean? You remember the differences between those three? Okay. We talked about source, receiver, feedback. Any question? Okay. This was the easier part of what we were doing. Verbal and nonverbal messages. Uh, we recapped nonverbal today already. We'll get back up to verbal coding again in just a minute. So if you have some specific questions on those theories, we'll uh, take those then. We talked about channels, noise, internal noise, external noise. And then we moved into a discussion of theory. Okay, and we said that for our purposes especially, it's important for us to develop a scientific attitude. Whether or not you actually go out and conduct research may depend on uh, whether or not you become a graduate student who needs to write a master's thesis or something. Uh, so some of you will actually do quantitative uh, or qualitative research, but uh, others of you just uh, d taking an orientation toward your life and toward the events around you that are uh, that's a scientific attitude can be useful in helping you analyze those situations, assess the situation. We looked at three perspectives, systems, laws, and rules. Uh, the laws perspective attempts to uh, emulate, copy what the, the hard sciences do, and set, whether it's a law of gravity or, or uh, Big Bang theories or whatever. Uh, we try to, we have certain laws within human behavior. Uh, we haven't gotten attribution theory yet, but things like people will systematically assign causes of behavior. People will discount one cause if other causes are plausible. You know, those have the status of laws. And so we've seen some things like that. We've spent a lot of time on systems theory, not going back there again. Uh, uh, a statement like people will seek information in order to reduce uncertainty. Okay, that, that's up there at the laws level. That's, people just do that. You know, I figure as soon as we stop taping, then you'll have lots of questions about uh, upcoming exams in order to reduce your uncertainty. But some of these folks are camera shy. Okay, rules perspective. We've talked about looking rules, conversational rules. Uh, there are lots of rules, and a lot of what we do in human communication is rules oriented. It's not as strong, the, the force behind the theory is not as strong, but that's because people are actors as well as reactors. We react in some situations, but in many situations we're the actor, we're the creator, and as such we have a choice. And as soon as I say, well this is how you're going to react in that situation, I just know because I've seen people before and I can generalize about this, and then you say, uh-uh, not me. 
I'm not going to study for the test. Now, some of you won't because you get distracted and do other things. But, you know, what, whatever it is, you have a choice about it. So, uh, and we'll come into uh, rules theory more. You'll see that on your syllabus uh, farther on. But uh, when we get to Scheinman off and rules theory, rules have to be followable. They have a prescriptive nature to them. There's some specific characteristics of rules. And that's kind of fun, looking at the theory of the rules that predict how we will and won't behave. But anyway, all of the things we're talking about this semester fall into one of those three domains. We talked about two types of study, qualitative versus quantitative. Qualitative, remember we talked about Bloomer and Kuhn, and we'll see their names splash by here again too in a minute. But there are very legitimate research projects and studies that are qualitative in nature that may involve uh, reading old diaries, reading collections of letters, uh, historical papers, uh, propaganda studies. Uh, when Dr. Williamson comes back the next time, she, one of the things she'll be talking with you about is relational communication and the work of Marianne Fitzpatrick up at Wisconsin. And what, what they've done is developed some marital typologies. Well, you know, people who are married, are they independents? Are they separates? And I don't want to go a long way with that. But that study was a qualitative study. Okay, it involved uh, tape recording and transcribing many, many hours of conversations between couples. They gave them certain topics to discuss and then let them go for 30 minutes or so, transcribe that, analyze that, and then based on things she'll explain to you, uh, classified them according to these marital typologies. Well, that's a qualitative humanistic approach, whereas uh, the quantitative approach is the scantron, fill in the data, generate the statistical analysis, analysis of variance of the independent and dependent variables and those kinds of things. Okay, taxonomies, theories, paradigms. Got those words straight? Paradigm, what's paradigm? Uh, paradigm is a theory that it's, it's bigger and more important than the, or it's a theory that shapes your worldview. I put it that way. It's a theory that's so important that it's, it's the modus operandi for the situation. The Big Bang Theory is the paradigm for most scientists for how the world was created. Uh, one book classified the, the Stephen Littlejohn Theories of Human, Human Communication book, which is also good outside reading, in addition to Heath's book that's on your syllabus. Uh, distinguishes between what he calls worldview one and worldview two. And in one case, it, one views people much from the stimulus response behavioristic reaction standpoint, that, that primarily people function as they do because they're reactors. Okay? But, but then a different paradigm says, no, people are creative, they are actors. And you can't have both. I mean, you can say, well, part of the time I'm an actor, part of the time I'm a reactor. But even when you do that, you're subscribing to the actor school of thought more than the reactor school of thought. But anyway, your paradigm is your way of, of seeing the, the world. Consistency theory provide, is a, a paradigmatic, <laughs> I'm saying that right, but anyway, is a theory that makes a useful paradigm for looking at the way people respond in a variety of situations. <clears throat> Taxonomy was just a list. Okay, we talked about functions of theories, and the flip side of those functions is how to evaluate the theory. You know, if, it, if a theory is supposed to be clear and simple and summarize and explain and predict, well then if you're evaluating to determine if that's a useful theory, you simply turn that around. You've got the long list again in your workbook. You know, but does the theory explain? Does it predict? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Okay, and then we looked at specific theory, systems theory, which we reviewed today because it's one of my favorites and it's it's probably the broadest one 
that we will consider this semester and it has such applicability across a variety of contexts. But we also looked at information theory. That was the day we did the little uh, pull the card out of the deck uh, exercise and we talked about bits versus pieces. Okay, And anytime you're seeking information, trying to reduce uncertainty, if you can get bits rather than pieces of information, you have better quality information. You reduce by half the alternatives. So that if you say, is the, is the test essay, or is the test, yes or no, is the test objective, yes or no, it, do we need a Scantron, yes or no, you know, those kinds of questions uh, provide, the answers to those, provide bits of information rather than pieces. And usually professors are more likely to answer you about bits than they are pieces. If you start saying, well, do we have to know equifinality? Do we have to know entropy? Do we have to know randomness? Do we have to know hierarchy? Uh, do we have to know open system? Do we have to know what a narrative is? I'm going to tell you yes to all of the above because you're supposed to have learned everything we've talked about this semester. Now, will they all be on the test? <laughs> I'm not telling. And, and in part, uh, well, mostly I'm not telling because I want you to study everything you're supposed to study. But the other thing is, too, the tests change and the questions vary. And so I might, you know, if, if I were to answer that one way, then that wouldn't be a true statement later on. And sometimes I haven't made the test out when you ask me that. Now, in this case, I have, and it's running under lock and key and all. But uh, when you go through that piecemeal, and we even have that word piecemeal to mean those little straining at gnats kinds of, of things, then you're not getting information that's as useful as the stuff that we would classify as bits. Okay, we move next then into the theories of verbal coding and thinking. Uh, Dr. Williamson was with us for that lecture. Signs, signals, symbols, semantics, pragmatics, syntactics. Okay, and you've got those uh, definitions in your notes too. Anything we, if we need to pick up on something we can. Okay, she talked with you about classical structural linguistics, psychological approaches to verbal coding, uh, spent some degree of time on Skinner and behaviorism and stimulus response theory, Chomsky and generative grammar, and we spent considerable time talking about language acquisition, and obviously the more time we spend on it, the more important we think it is. Okay, what did we decide about language acquisition, or did we? You hold your mic down so I that it's learned and it's a practice thing throughout life. Is that what we're talking about? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That is the how. How do we acquire language? And the response was it's learned, it's practiced throughout life. Uh, anybody want to add anything to that? Would Chomsky agree with that? going to be a long weekend, folks. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> Chomsky, pardon me, <clears throat> Chomsky would agree with, with a good chunk of that, but what did he also tell you in generative grammar? That there are deep structures, there are surface structures, oh, there's, there's more to it than just mimicking and reinforcing or being reinforced by the things that are in your environment. If you could only speak what you had heard spoken before, that puts you into one of these loops, then, and then we would never be able to communicate at all. Because the people who were trying to teach you the words couldn't teach you because they wouldn't have learned the words because there was nobody there to reinforce them. So at some point, uh, there's, there's some degree of innateness, 
some degree of inherent ability to manage language that we come packaged with, even though in infancy a very important part of language acquisition is learning to name things. That takes us back to Kuhn and the naming of objects. But an important part of this is learning to name things and learning the names of those things. Okay? But still, you are able to uh, express yourself, to have novel sentences, novel utterances, as he called them, that are unique to you. People think thoughts that, and express thoughts that nobody else has ever expressed. And so if it was all 100% learned, then that would not be possible. Okay, we got into theories of thinking, and again, the behavioristic versus cognitive approaches. We looked at Burns' notion of a concept and uh, how that gets formulated. Looked at that little tote cybernetic model of uh, test, operate, test, exit. Uh, and we talked about how, actually back under cybernetics, but it, it ties into this approach, of how our brain functions as a cybernetic mechanism. How you have the, the uh, control center with the uh, sensor, the comparator, the activator, all functioning in there. And, and whether it's the computer system that's doing this sensor, uh, sense, compare, activate process, or whether it's your brain that's doing that. Uh, it's working as a control mechanism. It's providing feedback for you positively or negatively about whether or not you need to continue on the path that you're going or whether you need to change that behavior, negative feedback, and deviate and, and change directions. And we also said that positive feedback may involve maintaining a deviation, but if you're deviating in the right direction, you know, you've got I think Dr. Lee was telling me that he's got 10 exams, little ones. A couple of you went into shock out there. Uh, he has 10 exams, 10% each in his class. So you've got lots of room to you know, go up or down or shift direction and so forth. But you start down in the 70s and work your way into the 80s. You're, you're going in the right direction and, you want, and that's positive feedback that says keep deviating if you're making 100s from the very beginning, you don't want to deviate. That's positive feedback, but it says stay exactly on the track that you're on. So uh, negative says change your direction. Positive says keep going in the direction that you're in. Okay. Talked about Piaget and the developmental school, the importance of reversibility, and uh, how that's fundamental to developing thought processes. Uh, we talked about Dewey and the reflective thinking pattern. And that's a good one for you on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, is, well, I mean, I guess all of these are in one sense or another, but uh, some have even more practical day-to-day uh, -day kinds of experiences, applications on experiences, day-to-day -day applications to them. But that reflective thinking pattern said what? You're going to identify the problem, you're going to assess the problem, uh, look at causes, effects, whatever the ramifications of that may be. Uh, you're going to list some possible alternatives, some possible solutions to the problem. I always think it's a good, and I think Dewey said this, but I know he said you need to establish criteria for your solution. And I think it's a good idea to establish the criteria before you even start to look at the possible solutions uh, or the possible choices. Sometimes <clears throat> if you get into the choices first, then uh, you get ego involved in the, in the choice. You know, well, it was my suggestion that we have an outdoor party at the Herman Park Rose Gardens in early May. Well, that may or may not be a good plan because of lots of reasons. But if you go back and set up your criteria first, 
It needs to, you know, that if we're planning a party, it needs to be something we can afford. It needs to fit within a certain timeline. The space needs to be large enough to accommodate the group. Uh, temperature and weather could be a factor. Uh, you know, one of the worst weddings I ever went to, it, it was happy as far as the couple was concerned, but it was outdoors in the botanical gardens in May. And there were mosquitoes everywhere. Now, I guess they had anticipated this to a point because they had citronella candles and they had off spray. You know, there, there were things there to presumably offset that disadvantage. But it was a very strange, actually, you made some new friends, you know, because you had total strangers who were saying, may I, you know, and just, sure, you know, and smack, you were slapping each other on the back. Uh, killing bugs or, uh, you know, here, would, would you just take this can and spray me down, please? You know, so it was, it was different. Okay. Uh, but anyway, whether, whether you're planning a big wedding with 500 people coming, maybe that's not big, so a thousand people, whatever, or if you're just going after something like a loaf of bread, if you set up the criteria to start with, you know, what color does it need to be? Does it need to be fresh? Anybody want to buy bread that the package is ripped open? No, you know, you want your bread fresh. You want it in a certain price range. You want it a certain flavor. Uh, it may need a particular shape if you're making sandwiches or if you're going to turn it into garlic toast or whatever. Oh, but anyway, back to Dewey. So you set up your criteria and then you list your possible solutions, then you go back and apply the criteria to your choices, and then you're in a much more natural, feasible, functional place to make that choice and live with it and be satisfied with it. So yeah, that, that's a good, it's, it's an old established approach. Again, it's a taxonomy rather than a theory because it won't predict what people will do. It's simply a list of the steps that you ought to go through in order to accomplish problem solution. Okay, so see that difference between uh, things like attribution theory and rules theory, th some things that predict versus uh, those things that are, are simply useful lists that we can use as guides for accomplishing whatever we're trying to accomplish. Okay, theories of meaning. Uh, we looked at Boulding's notion of the image, how we all have that view of the world that we carry around with us. We have views of other people. We're going to see this theme carried through even more uh, when we get over in the interpersonal unit and start looking at, there's a word called schemata. Uh, there's Jesse Delia's constructivism. Uh, anyway, this, this theory is kind of a root theory out of which others build and grow and are similar but more sophisticated that have to do with how we develop our view of the world. And that's important. And, well, I don't want to jump ahead yet. Okay, we looked at the Ogden Richards Triangle of Meaning. Remember up there at the top was the thought, the symbol, the referent, or real object. There's a broken line across the bottom because there's an arbitrary or imputed relationship between the symbol and the real object. Okay, There are causal relationships, but not everywhere. The thought can cause the production of the symbol. The symbol can cause or produce the thought. The real object produces the thought. It's hard to look at this red pen and not think about it, but you can think about it and not produce it. So that side of your triangle is not two-way causal. You can think about breakfast, but you know it won't appear. So the object produces the thought, the symbol produces the thought, the thought produces the symbol, but the thought does not produce the object or real thing. And then there's an arbitrary relationship, depending on what language you're using, uh, between the symbol and the object. 
Okay, we talked about Osgood semantic space, the three-dimensional space that we all carry around up there in our heads, uh, and, and those three factors of activity, potency, evaluation, and we place things up there as being good or bad, weak or strong. I just forgot one. Anyway, the other one, <laughs> active or inactive. Okay, and so whether it's the moon or cobra snakes or thunderstorms or lightning or poodle dogs or our mutual friend, you know, virtually everything that you have a concept, a conceptualization of for which there is a concept up there in your brain, it's rated on those three dimensions. The color pink, the color lime, the color red, the color black. And there's some, and on and on, you know, throughout the rainbow of colors. And there are some of those things that we share, that we, we place similarly in our semantic space. Okay? And then there are other things that we place differently. And understanding where your audience, this ties right back into persuasion theory, understanding what kind of semantic space your audience has, you know, will help you decide what kind of message you want to construct, what kind of message you need to construct. If we have things in the same place in our semantic space, then we're likely to be agreeing on issues. And that's a very different thing, of course, than if we have placed those things differently in our semantic space. And, and if we have real different cognitions about concepts or issues, you know, George Bush Sr. is famous for his statement about hating broccoli. I don't know if there's anything we could do to convince him to eat broccoli, you know. But there are others of us who love broccoli. And, and so that poor little passive green vegetable is placed differently in cognitive space, but uh, in semantic space, placed different cognitive, placed differently cognitively. Okay. So anyway, that's a very important model. Both of those models are important. I sometimes ask folks to draw the diagram on the exam, talk to me about it, uh, explain it. The way I come at it varies. You know, but, but these are very useful. They're very applicable. They explain what's going on in terms of uh, how we process meaning, how we decode messages and place that meaning in our cognitive space. And that in turn affects our ability to encode messages because you're reaching into, via your thought processes, you're reaching into your brain into the meanings that you filed up there to pull that information out in order to create a message. Now we talked about the linguistic relativity principle, the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, which says the language of our culture, the language of anyone's culture, shapes their view of the world. And we talked about Hopi Indians with present tense verbs. Um, uh, we talked about the beehive cultures that would have difficulty in, in a room like ours with uh, lots of rectangles. There's another short but interesting example of, a, of an Eskimo tribe. That, I don't, did we talk about Eskimo tribe that nearly starved to death? I don't think we talked about that one. Um, uh, this is a case where, where the language and thought processes of the culture, and, and this is reported in a little journal article, but the uh, this particular tribe was not problem solution oriented in its thinking, the way we just talked about all of Dewey's steps. And so the tribe almost died out because, and this is like a hundred years ago, but they almost became extinct because it was a bad year for food, you know, caribou crop was down or, you know, the herd didn't come where it was supposed to. But the people went right on eating the same foods at the same rate that they normally did, and then they ran out of food, and their people starved. Now, our natural instinct as Western thinkers, as products of our culture, would be to say, well, why didn't they go fish? 
You know, why, why did they catch some fish and eat that instead? Why didn't they move the tribe and go find some edible berries? Why didn't they ration the food? Why didn't they have a lottery and, and you know, draw straws or something and, and decide who would live and who would, instead of everybody keeping on doing things the way that they'd done? Well, we could pursue that at length, but we won't. The point is, the language of our culture uh, shapes our view of the world and inherent in that language are also the thought processes, the way of thinking and included in that is the way of problem solving. So this superior wharf hypothesis is important. Whether or not it's, it's the kind of verbs you have to express yourself or whether or not it's gender related language and whether masculine language forms actually create patriarchal society and uh, f uh, feminine ending forms create matriarchal societies and whether that's a good or bad thing or not, you know, I leave the value judgments up to you. But the premise of the principle is that our language uh, shapes and predisposes, shapes our view of the world and predisposes the way that we function and act within that. Okay, we talked about Bernstein's elaborated and restricted codes, elaborated being uh, the more general, the restricted being those codes like what's up, and, and I'm not going to do it the real way, you know. Uh, the, but those things that are, are unique to a special, uh, specific group, and particularly if you have secret passwords and uh, things, you know, to get you into the fraternity meeting or the uh, fraternal lodge or whatever it might be. So some codes are shared and public, and others are much more restricted. Okay, we talked about interaction and dramatism. We looked at Mead's symbolic interaction, had a lot of uh, generalizations there, and uh, you can check your workbook if you need to review those. Uh, how the Mead School of Thought split into two camps, Bloomer at the University of Chicago with the humanistic approach, and to Kuhn at the University of Iowa with a more quantitative orientation. And we looked at some of the, we're getting a little bit short on time, but we looked at some of the uh, subsets of what, of each, what each of those groups uh, studied and reviewed. And then we uh, looked at Kenneth Burke and the dramaturgical approach and using that dramatic metaphor and, and the very, very important methodological tool that Burke developed called the dramatistic pentad. And that one's easy to remember because pentad means five. But the act, the agent, the agency, the scene, the purpose. And how that, uh, we said under theories that one of the characteristics of a useful theory is that it has heuristic value, that it has research generating value. And the dramatistic pentad has generated many, many master's theses, you know, by taking act, agent, agency, scene, purpose, and you don't have to do them in that order. You could start with the scene and the purpose, or the scene, and then the, you'd probably start with the act and do the scene, and, but anyway, you can take those five in whatever sequence makes sense to what you're doing, and, uh, develop a chapter on each one, add an introduction and a conclusion, and, you know, there you've got a pretty hearty master's thesis if you wrote enough on each subject. But anyway, it's a good way to, even if you're not writing a thesis, it's a good way to analyze a situation, whether it's a, a community disaster or a presidential debate, whatever the case may be. Okay, we looked at narrative theories of Borman and Fisher, uh, things like fantasy theme analysis, and today I've already been talking about the importance of the narrative, uh, both as a form of social, individual self-expression, as well as uh, in persuasive contexts as a means of persuasion. Okay, then we looked at general semantics, Korzybski and Johnson, uh, things like non-identity, non-allness, uh, dating, indexing, some of those concepts that they provide for us to help us understand how language works, how language represents something other than itself, just like the map uh, represents territory, but it's not the real thing, and how the map can't represent all of the territory, and so language can't represent all that there is to know 
about a particular situation. So that mapping analogy is a good one that comes out of that. But any, any question about those concepts? I think we were hurrying a little bit the day we were finishing those. Okay, well you've got them defined uh, in your workbook if you need to go back through and, and double check on those two. Okay, nonverbal coding, we reviewed that today. Kinesics, proxemics, paralanguage. Uh, Eggman and Friesen's functional theory was the one that looked at the origin and the coding and so forth, the source, the origin coding of the uh, gestures like illustrators and emblems and so forth and, and how those are used to code and function in particular situations. And Dittman's theory of emotional deviation was the one that said uh, we look at deviations from what is normal. We look at uh, what's the usual behavior of a person and compare that to what we see at any particular point in time. Okay, and then we look for changes in those behaviors. Okay, we looked at Aristotle and classical roots. McGuire gave us a definition of attitude. Uh, we looked at the relationship between beliefs and values and attitude. We looked at consistency theory. Hyder had uh, the intrapersonal model. Newcomb gave us the interpersonal or two-person model. Uh, we looked at length at Festinger and cognitive dissonance theory and how people respond when they have discrepant messages and the kinds of things they do to uh, reduce that discrepancy, reduce that dissonance. Okay, then when Dr. Williamson was here, she went over uh, their short but relevant little theories of incentive theory, self-perception theory, uh, impression management, and we'll see more of that as we get to interpersonal. Uh, spent a lot of time talking with you about influenceability, general persuasibility, and the factors that go into uh, those, and how the overall information processing takes place, and social judgment theory we've already reviewed today. And then finally in part three, uh, today we looked at the elaboration likelihood model, how people cognitively process the information with central and peripheral routing of messages and Monroe's motivated sequence of those. Now the other thing we haven't really talked about, and it's just a tiny part of your unit, is propaganda. And uh, in your book you'll see the comparison of Doob and Elul. Doob basically taking the position that propaganda is that bad stuff, that unscientific stuff uh, that, that serves unscientific ends and that it's, it's not good for society. Alul, on the other hand, is saying it's part of the educational process and that virtually all persuasive messages are propaganda of one sort or another. Now this is one of those places where the theories don't fit. You know, we said a, a useful theory is one that fits in with existing knowledge, existing evidence, and just blends in and sheds additional light. This is one of those places you have to choose. You know, is propaganda uh, what the other guy is doing? Is it bad stuff or not? Uh, when corporate structures mail out a whole packet of of information, that, you know, they're they're out polluting water, or they're cutting down the rainforest. But then they send a packet of materials to the elementary school teachers to tell them all the wonderful things that their corporation is doing for the environment. Well, is that educational, or is that propaganda? Hmm. You know, and I won't try to settle that one in what two easy steps today, but. It's a judgment call that you have to make as the consumer, as the listener. You have to decide where are you going to put that word propaganda up there in your cognitive space. You know, um, I did an analysis of George Wallace's 68, 1968 presidential campaign and uh, started, it's my doctoral dissertation, if you're ever really bored and want something to read. Uh, but, but one of the things I did is make a list of propaganda techniques and then apply those to Wallace. But, it, but my position at that point in time, and kind of still today, is 
the propaganda is the bad stuff. And it doesn't really matter where you place it, except it's useful to me to make a distinction between the two, that there are mass campaigns that are uh, educational in nature, and there's good propaganda and there's bad propaganda. Yes, that's what I'm saying. And, and uh, Dube would say that it's all bad and that we should call it something else. We should call the good propaganda something else. So, you know, it's a little bit of a semantic game that you're dealing with there. But uh, anyway, that's, that's kind of an interesting approach that you can take to that. And we'll see a little bit more of that when we get to the mass communication materials and, and the mass influence. Then we'll see some historical events and things where, where there have been, uh, you know, propaganda via leaflets in World War II, propaganda from Pravda against the United States, those kinds of things. Okay, that's our general review, and I will take any individual questions that you may have. Anybody ask anything? You're off the air now. It's safe for you.